I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. Hey, what's poppin' my homies? Hope you're doing well, feeling blessed, having a good day, having a good week. UFC Fight Night, Tui Vaza versus Marcin Tybora. Now, looking at my bets for UFC 299, I dusted up UFC 299. I should have clean sweeped, really. You know, Pereira won that fight by KOTKO. He was just greedy enough to go for two stoppages in one fight. You know, Michael Alexei should quit. I knew his striking defense was dusty. And he basically got KO'd. So yeah guys, really I should have clean sweeped. But UFC 299, that's profit. UFC 298, that was profit. And head over to my Patreon to get my full lineup of bets for Tui Vaza versus Tybora. I also believe that's going to be profit. Now moving into Money City. Guys, as always, if you see your name on the screen, you already know. That's money. Pure money. Money City money. Let's go. And there's a few champions this week. So shout out to all the guys that dusted up UFC 299. I'm glad I can join you in doing that. Be sure to drop down your Money City comments for Tui Vaz and Tybora this UFC fight night. And don't forget to hashtag your comment. Money City. Alright guys, let's go. Alright guys, first match up on the card, we've got Chad and Halija taking on Haralampus Grigoriu. Now in this matchup, you've got a tough, scrappy grappler in Chad and Halija. Right, this dude's scrappy. His boxing's not really good though. If you look at Chad's boxing, it's really bad, in my opinion. And on the flip side, Haralampus Grigoriu, this dude's got stopping power. You know, you see that on the contender, the one-two. The one-two he set his opponent down with, you know, clean, super clean. Now guys, in my opinion, if Chad and Halija doesn't take Haralampus Grigoriu to grapple City, you know, take him to the mat, wrestle City. If he doesn't do that, more than likely the striking of Haralampus will be effective. I just think Chad and Halija is more about grit and determination compared to skill. And I do side with the skill most of the time. Not all the time. But most of the time. For example, guys, last week, if you're someone that took Marlon Vera, you didn't take Marlon Vera because you believed it was skillfully better than Sean O'Malley. And if you did, then, yeah, you've got to put the blunt down. But in my opinion, the pick is going to be the newcomer, Grigorio. Now, moving into a matchup between Corey McKenna taking on Jacqueline and Morim. Now, guys, this matchup is a very decent matchup because Corey McKenna is a scrappy little hobbit. You know, she's a tough girl, but she's also primarily a grappler. And that's interesting because does she want to use her grappling against someone like Jacqueline and Morim? And Morim's a very, very decent jujitsu player. You know, do you want to grapple with this girl? In terms of who's a better mixed martial artist, who's more well-rounded, in my opinion, it's going to be Corey. Now, guys, what you often find with young fighters, they always fall back on what they do best or what they know best. And in Corey's situation, what she knows best is grappling. Now, that's something you potentially don't want to do against Jacqueline Amorim. But guys, looking at the flip side, Jacqueline Amorim, her striking's not good. Her cardio's not good. Even the wrestling of Jacqueline Amorim, it's not good. She's primarily a jiu-jitsu player competing in mixed martial arts, which is dangerous because you have to constantly be improving the weak points. And if you're not, then you're essentially liable to get dusted. Now, guys, who I want to win the matchup is going to be Corey McKenna. But I think if we see some grappling, you know, Amorim's going to throw up the armbar. She's going to throw up the triangle. And even if she doesn't get the triangle or the armbar, she's so good on the mat that she's going to use those attacks to sweep into a more dominant position on the mat. My prediction is going to be Corey McKenna gets wrapped up like a blunt. I think Amorim probably submits her, but I'd love to be wrong. I'd love to see the matchup stay on the feet. Moving into a matchup between Josh Kulabel taking on Danny Silva. And guys, this matchup is a decent stand-up fight. Decent boxing matchup. If you're somebody that enjoys boxing, you're going to enjoy the matchup between Danny Silva and Josh Kulabel. And I'm assuming everyone does enjoy boxing because you wouldn't watch mixed martial arts. Now guys, Josh Kulabel, he's very tough. He's very scrappy. But his calf kick defense is kind of dusty. Now on the flip side, you've got Danny Silva. This guy had an absolute bomb burner on the contender. And at times in that fight, I was kind of thinking, you know, is this Adrian Yanez? The way Danny Silva opens up with the hooks, the way he rips to the body, the way he generates power... It's very similar to Adrian Yanez. But the thing with Danny Silva, he's very hittable. He stays in the pocket, similar to Adrian Yanez. See, guys, boxers who believe in their boxing at this level, they've really got to understand that moving their feet is still going to be part of the game. You know, you can't just hang out in the pocket all night. But I'll tell you what, 
if Danny Silva chooses to hang out in the pocket, then you've got a fire matchup. You've got an absolute barn burner because both these guys can box. And if Danny Silva's going to say, look, I'll hang out in the pocket, throw your punches, let's go. If Danny Silva does that, Josh Kulabau is not going to run away from the fight. You know, both these guys, they're going to stand and trade. They're going to stand and sit on their punches. I'm going to side with the underdog, Danny Silva, but there is some concerns to making that pick. Firstly, the inexperience of Danny Silva, the cardio, and also the bad boxing defense. You know, the fact he's hanging out in the pocket. Those are the concerns, but at the same time, you're getting a, a decent number. Personally, I'm not going to bet it, but yeah, the pick is going to be Danny Silva, the underdog. Now, moving into a matchup between Thiago Moises taking on Mitch Ramirez. And guys, there's really no reason for me to waste your time on a matchup like this. Same as Josh Parisian from last week. Now, guys, last week... It's funny. Listen to this. Last week, as Josh Parisian's walking to the octagon, Joe Rogan said, word for word, Josh Parisian is fundamentally sound. Stop it. Stop it. That's my favorite line from UFC 299. Josh Parisian, fundamentally sound. The moment I heard that, I was like, okay, if he's fundamentally sound, he shouldn't be asleep in like two minutes. Took 17 seconds. Dusted. Now my prediction with this matchup, Thiago Moises is an elite jujitsu player. His jujitsu is extremely good. And I know that Mitch Ramirez wants to stay on the feet, wants to use his boxing, but the moment the fight goes to the mat, there's a, a massive difference in terms of jujitsu. So give me Moises to wrap him up like a blunt, smoke him up like a blunt in round one or round two on the mat. Now moving into a matchup between Ode Osborne taking on Jafel Filio, and this is good matchmaking. Now Ode Osborne, in my opinion, he's not bad. He's definitely not bad. Now some people may say his IQ is kind of questionable, and I wouldn't disagree. He tried to dust up Tyson Nam with a jump knee, and as he missed the jump knee, returned to his feet, and essentially got folded like a deck chair. Dusted. And guys, Ode Osborne also has bad grappling. Most of his losses are via submission which isn't a good thing here against Javel Filio because Filio is an excellent grappler. His jiu-jitsu is extremely good. However, guys, looking at the striking and also the striking defense of Javel Filio, it's really not good. He got dropped cleanly by a nasty body kick against Danny Perez. To be honest, guys, I'd say credit to the UFC for this matchup because Ode Osborne's grappling's not good and he's competing against someone that's a grappling expert. And on the feet, Jafel's striking's not good defensively and offensively. He did land some nice body shots against Danny Perez, but for the most part, looked really uncomfortable on the feet. And Ode Osborne has got fast kicks. You know, he can land the kicks to the body. So someone's going to get dusted, essentially. And in a matchup like this, you know, a risky matchup where if it stays on the feet, Jafal's going to get dusted. If it goes to the mat, Ode's going to get dusted. In a matchup that's pretty risky, in my opinion, take the underdog. Give me Ode. Now moving into a matchup between Josiani Nunes taking on Chelsea Chandler, a decent scrap. Now guys, Josiani Nunes is extremely aggressive. She's like an aggressive little pit bull. She's going to be really aggressive. She's going to throw big overhands. She's going to throw big hooks. And that's because she's got up because she's five foot two. You know, she's at a physical disadvantage. So for Josiane Nunes, staying in the pocket, remaining aggressive in the pocket, that's something she's got to do. And that's something she likes to do. She has been doing that. She's been successful at doing that. However, on the flip side, we've got Chelsea Chandler. She's a runner. She's a track star. She's going to run away from the boxing when it heats up. You know, that's what she done. She turned her back to Norma Dumont, became a track star, became a runner. Now, guys, clearly Chelsea Chandler doesn't enjoy the striking. So if she's made to strike with Josiane Nunes, then she may get folded. She may become a track star. So, guys, in my opinion, it's going to be a matchup decided based on where the fight takes place. If we're on the feet, you'd expect Nunes to be effective with her aggressive boxing style. However, guys, if we go to the mat, that's where the Brazilian jiu-jitsu of Chelsea Chandler is uh, potentially effective enough to hand Josiana Nunes her first loss in the UFC. For me personally, give me another underdog. Give me Chelsea Chandler. Now moving into a matchup between Mike Davis taking on Natan Levy. And guys, on paper, Mike Davis should win the fight. You know, he's a, a sharper boxer, a sharper grappler, better wrestler. But guys, I do want to mention that Mike Davis is a little bit inactive, you know, and he did beat Slava. You know, he dominated Slava with the wrestling, with the grappling. But guys, for some reason, Mike Davis looks stuck in the mud in round two. 
his cardio looked bad. Now, like I said, Mike Davis did win that fight. He used his wrestling, you know, got Slava to the mat multiple times, clearly won the fight. But the concern is, you know, the footwork wasn't good, stuck in the mud, and his striking wasn't great. So guys, if the matchup stays on the feet, and Mike Davis looks like Mike Davis from last fight, in my opinion, you know, this matchup could be closer than what it should be. But yeah, I'm going to side with Mike Davis just to speak a little bit about Natan Levy. Natan is a, a karate player. He's a karate striker. And guys, I don't bet on karate. I fade karate. And Natan Levy also fatigues. You know, see him against Rafa Garcia. Got super tired. Obviously against Gennaro Valdez, that's a better performance. And I did take Natan Levy in that fight. But yeah, Gennaro Valdez is like a, a Mexican punch bag. So give me Mike Davis. Now moving into a matchup between Gerald Mearshart taking on Brian Barbarena. An absolute banger. Now guys, we know Gerald Mearshart has excellent jujitsu. His grappling is very good. And I'd go as far to say that his grappling is the only thing in his game that's actually good. Essentially, Gerald Mearshart is like the American Paul Craig. You know, dusty chin, dusty cardio, but his grappling's very good. And just like Paul Craig, Gerald Mearshart is a solid underdog. But guys, he's not an underdog in this matchup. He's actually a big favourite. And on the flip side, you've got Barbarena, an absolute dog. Now guys, if GM3 gets Bam Bam to the mat, more than likely wraps him up like a blunt. No doubt. But guys, in my opinion, GM3 is not worth minus 250. You know, the chin's dusty, the cardio's dusty, the striking's not great. I think his body kicks have always been pretty good, but I'd still favour Bam Bam to box him up. So give me another underdog. Give me Bam Bam. Moving into a matchup between Panny Kienza taking on Macy Chiazon, female MGK. One of my favourite fighters. You know, Macy Chiazon's good. She's pretty solid. Kinda. What makes Macy Cheers on so effective is gonna be the size. You know, she's like six foot. And I sound like a broken record when I say this, but with women's mixed martial arts, it's more about the physicality rather than the skill. You know, like my Macy Barber breakdown from last week, I wanted to paint the picture that Macy Barber's the bully, you know, against someone that couldn't bully their way out of a paper bag. Macy Cheers on is physically strong. Not the best boxer, not the best kicker, not the best grappler. But she's like six foot. And that makes her a problem. That makes her female MGK. Now on the flip side, you've got Panny. Panny Kianzap, man. She's a good boxer. Technically, she's pretty good. But if you look at Panny in her most recent fight, Ketlin bullied her. Ketlin was physically strong. Just like Macy Chiazon. So guys, the prediction's going to be Macy Chiazon to bully Panny Kianzad. Take downs whenever she wants. Push her against the fence. And also to stay nice and long with the jab. You know, she's six foot, like I said. So the strikes, they should stay long. But yeah, this should be a win for Fima MGK. All right, moving into a banger. We've got Christian Rodriguez taking on Isaac Dolgarian. Now, guys, Christian Rodriguez, this guy's a prospect. How do we know that Christian Rodriguez is a prospect or at least a prospect killer? He went in there and beat Ral Roses Jr. as a massive underdog. And then he beat Cameron Simon in both the stand-up and the grappling, which is highly impressive. However... The Midwest chopper, Isaac Dolgarian. Guys, this guy might be the real deal. He might be. We can't say for sure because he hasn't had the same experience, the same test as C-Rod. You know, he hasn't even been past round one. So, yeah, he's not tested like C-Rod. However, guys, looking at Isaac Dolgarian, the wrestling, the elbows on the mat, the ground and pound, it's nasty. Now, guys, I'm pretty sure that Dolgarian gets a takedown early in round one. But what I'm not entirely sure about is, will Dolgarian get another round one stoppage? Now, let's hypothetically say he doesn't get a round one stoppage. In that case, you're now seeing Dolgarian enter a round two for the first time. And not only going into round two for the first time, but going into round two against a prospect like C-Rod. So guys, it's possible that Dolgarian does have a good first round, sees a second round for the first time, and then starts to get dusted up on the feet. However, I'm not going to side with that narrative. My story is going to be... Dolgarian gets a takedown in round one, starts to smash C-Rod into the canvas. I think C-Rod's going to survive, be the first one to essentially take Dolgarian into round two. But I think C-Rod's going to get dusted up so badly in round one, so damaged in round one, that the takedown in round two is going to be pretty easy. And once he gets the fight back to the mat in round two, that's where we're going to see more of a stoppage. We're not going to see survival. The prediction's going to be Isaac
classic Dolgarian with a round two stoppage. The elbows on the mat are just savage. I think Christian Rodriguez, you know, survives round one. No one survived round one against Isaac yet. I think he does that. But I don't see him stopping the takedown. And if he doesn't stop the takedown, he's going to get dusted. So give me the Midwest chopper, Isaac Dolgarian. Moving into a matchup between Kennedy and Zechaku taking on OSP. Guys, come on now. No need for me to waste your time with a matchup like this, a breakdown like this. OSP is 40. He's 40. He shouldn't be out boxing Kennedy. He shouldn't be out grappling Kennedy. Guys, remember the wrestling masterclass that Kennedy put on Carl Robeson. You know what I'm saying? OSP's not going to be able to get Kennedy to the mat. And obviously, if the matchup stays on the feet, just go look at OSP against Philippe Linz. Go look at that. The winner of the matchup is clearly going to be Kennedy and Zetraku. And if that doesn't happen... He should get cut. You should be cut if you lose to a 40-year-old OSP. Moving into the co-main event, we've got Brian Battle taking on Ange Losa. And this is a very decent co-main event. But guys, I'm going to simplify the breakdown, simplify the co-main event. It seems to me that the first seven and a half minutes, it should be about Ange Losa. And that's because he's very powerful, very aggressive in the first portion of the matchup. However, if he doesn't get a stoppage in that time... He's got to be prepared for the second half of the fight. Because if you're someone that watches tape, just like myself, you're noticing that Angelo Sarp, his final round is really bad. Like his cardio turns to pure dust. And he's essentially there to be stopped in those final five minutes. And that's the price you're going to pay when you use so much energy early in the fight, early in round one. That's the trade-off, right? Yes, I'm going to be aggressive in the opening exchanges. Yes, I'm probably going to win round one. I may get a stoppage. And if you don't get a stoppage, you're then forced to go into round two after using a lot of energy. And you may not win round two. And then you may start to realize I've used so much energy. I may not make it to the end of the fight. I may not make it to the bell. And guys, here's the thing with Brian Battle. The dude's a finisher. Whether it's a head kick, whether it's counter hooks in the pocket, whether it's taking your back on the mat. Brian Battle will finish you if you get tired. More than not. So guys, I actually think Losa could be 2-0 up. You know, he could be winning the fight. But if he gets tired against Brian Battle, look for Battle to find a stoppage. Give me Brian Battle. Give me the Butcher. Guys, he changed his name to the Butcher. That tells me everything I need to know. Brian Battle's the pick. Moving into the main event, we've got Taito Ivaza taking on Marcin Tybora. And I did get the last heavyweight prediction wrong between uh, Gazeev and Rosenstrake. So maybe I get this one right or maybe I get it wrong. We'll see. But heavyweight mixed martial arts, it's not easy. It's not easy to predict. And the reason as to why that is, it just takes one clean connection and the fight's done. However, guys, if you're someone that's betting on Taito Ivaza, you're not really worried about the power of Marcin Tybora. The main concern in betting Taito Ivaza would be his great ground game you know his jiu-jitsu it's really non-existent you know you see against Volkov dusted on the mat he got dusted on the mat by Spivak so the ground game of Taito Ivaza it's never been good but that's because the dude's a banger he wants to stand and trade he wants to stand and literally throw bombs and we love Taito Ivaza for that you know we're all for that we love that so if the matchup goes to the mat we've got Taito Ivaza who's like a white belt against Marcin Taibora who's a black belt however Let's say that Taito Ivaza is able to land those nasty Muay Thai kicks, nasty calf kicks. He's able to touch the jaw, the dusty jaw of Marcin Taibora. In that case, we're looking at Shuis. We're looking at celebrating into the night because one of the most likable fighters has just won their first UFC main event. In my opinion, how do you pick against Tai? It couldn't be me. It couldn't be me in this spot. No way. Guys, give me Taito Ivaza via complete dusteration, via complete deletion. Round one or round two. I think it's tires time. Let's go. As always, guys, drop down your main event, your co-main event, your straight bets, your doubles, your money city bets. And as always, keep your eyes to the sky and never glue to your shoes. Peace.